Hello, everyone. I'm Neil Baer, uh, one of the executive producers of Welcome to Chattanooga. Thank you all so much for joining our panel discussion today, which will be incisive and provocative. We've got uh, four really interesting and devoted um, folks who do all kinds of work related to this film. We'll have Leosha Gorshkov, John Pachenkis, Deirdre Stradone, and Sten Vermond all speaking uh, shortly. And then we will have a conversation amongst the five of us where we'll take questions as well. I got involved in uh, the film because the director, David France, came to me and he knew that uh, I was really interested in social justice issues, particularly pertaining to the LGBTQ plus community. And I knew his film uh, previously, the one that was Oscar nominated, um, that uh, dealt with uh, the AIDS crisis. And so I jumped at the chance um, to be involved in his most recent film, Welcome to Chechnya. Uh, when I came to the film, it had already been shot and I started uh, in watching the editing process. What was really fascinating about the editing was that we all, before we went into the editing room, had to deposit our cell phones outside in a little box. And the reason is because uh, no one was ever allowed to film any part of the, of the film. And as you've seen by watching it, the reason is clear. We needed to protect the identities of all of the refugees from Chechnya. So their real identities are forever um, hidden. Uh, and I'll go into in a moment how we did that kind of um, deep fake uh, work to cover up their, their real faces and to protect them. Uh, people really hadn't heard about what was going on in Chechnya, a government sanctioned program to uh, really extinguish all LGBTQ people from the country that was promoted by the Chechen government and Kadyrov, the president who is still the president. Um, what was profound and so horribly disturbing is that uh, the government in, incited families, parents, siblings to do honor killings of their, of their children and their brothers and sisters in the name of um, religion and, and honor. And this is something uh, we had never seen before. We've seen genocide in all of its terrible traumatizing forms, but we've never seen families taking on their own children and siblings and, and murdering them. Um, one thing that's come up often when we've screened the film at festivals and had discussions is um, first, uh, why did we show such intense footage? And the answer is because we needed to show that these things were going on. And we did have some discussions in the editing room about how much to prepare people for those um, actual uh, terrifying pieces of footage that you saw. And we thought that it was critically important to show this to, to make sure that people really understood the extent to which the Chechen government was going to uh, truly eliminate through genocide LGBTQ people. So uh, that footage was obtained uh, through various LGBTQ organizations and people surreptitiously, of course, uh, took pictures through their cell phones. Um, the way that David France, um, who made the other film, How to Survive a Plague, which many of you I'm sure have seen, uh, did this was that he um, used a cell phone uh, as a decoy. So he would be on his cell phone, but he would use a GoPro or another cell phone that was hidden to do the actual foot, uh, filming. Um, as you saw, there were a number of LGBTQ activists from Russia, including Olga Bar, who had to flee and they um, risk their lives. They're the true heroes along with the refugees of this story. So David went as a tourist to Chechnya numerous times shooting along with the, the director of photography. Another question that's come up often is how did we change the faces? So um, it's a really uh, important question because it's the first time 
deep fake has been used for a documentary. And um, Ryan Laney, the visual effects artist who's done many films, came up with an approach. And what, we, what he did is he uh, covered the 23 Chechen participants um, who, whom you see throughout the film, except for, of course, uh, Maxim, who is revealed at the end, um, by getting volunteers in the United States. And it was literally a facial transplantation that occurred where um, Ryan would uh, invite the volunteers in and they gave their permission to have their faces used. He would shoot them using multiple cameras, often eight, nine cameras in various kinds of express expressions, um, activities, so that literally their faces could be transplanted onto the refugees. And that's how it was done. You can imagine now that for other human rights um, projects that this will be very important because we can protect the identities of people in ways that we couldn't before. So this film would probably have not been as engaging emotionally if we had pixelated people's faces. But we knew we had to, to give them facial transplants because the Chechen diaspora has been told by the government and president to weed out Chechens who are queer, gay, LGBTQ, anywhere in the world. So uh, ethically, we had to provide cover. The reason, as you saw in the film, that Maxim's face uh, was not, was because Maxim had come out publicly uh, in Russia in the court case and, and gave permission for his face to be used in the film. And Maxim is now in a, um, a legal case in the international uh, court. And you can find out more about that by going to um, welcometochechnia.com and clicking on take action. And you can follow what's going on with Maxim's case and how to support um, the LGBTQ community in Russia that is still trying to move people out of Chechnya. We're very concerned about what's going on in Chechnya because recently two Chechen uh, men who were in Russia were kidnapped and brought back to Chechnya. And so we're going um, to the LGBTQ uh, equity caucus uh, in Congress and we're going to the State Department to really ask them to get involved. Um, as you saw in the film, the United States has not taken any um, uh, refugees yet, and that was during the Trump administration. We hope that that will change. It, that these refugees have been taken in, in numerous countries in Europe and in Canada. And if you're interested in the Rainbow Railroad, they've been very um, involved as well, and they're a Canadian organization. So when did this all start? Um, there is a Russian journalist uh, by the name of Elena Milashina, and she was the first to report on what was going on in Chechnya around 2017. And Masha Gessen, whose work is renowned uh, in uh, The New Yorker, first did the um, American uh, English version of what was going on in 2017. And she wrote numerous pieces for The New Yorker about the, the travesty of Chechnya and what was going on, the sanctioned murder of uh, innocent people. Um, so we have Masha to thank and David France, the director, along with Alice Hinty and Joy Tompkin, the producers, um, worked with Masha to translate her work to this documentary. They were inspired by Masha, so we must give them great thanks for their work. So um, we're going to uh, begin uh, with each, each of our panelists uh, telling who they are and how they're related to this film and the sense of the work that they do and the passion that they bring to their work. And then we will uh, have a conversation and uh, open it up to questions from you. So if you do have questions, you can uh, put them into the chat. Uh, we're anxious to answer them. And we would like you to fill out a very brief um, survey at the end. So um, thank you all again for your commitment to human rights, social justice, protecting LGBTQ people around the world by coming to this event and watching the film. So first um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, 
uh, Leosha, and he'll introduce himself and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Neil. And thank you everyone for joining us. And I guess I'm gonna uh, divide my little presentation and in introduction in a few parts because I'm directly involved in the case of Russia because I'm a political asylee from Russia and I fled Russia in 2014 after the propaganda law was introduced and being a queer professor in the region where actually Maxim from. So Maxim, who is a, one of the heroes of the movie and documentary and the, that real story is from my region uh, where a culture of intolerance is very high. And uh, in 2014, I've been already a deputy dean for student affairs and I've been doing queer studies in Russia and basically introduced queer studies to the political science and humanities. And uh, in 2013, I was uh, politely followed by the secret services, which probably you know as a KGB or now we call it federal security services. After the law was introduced to the public, the federal security services established and especially in high ed institution, they watch dogs who will control the ideological climate of the university. And that person tried to recruit me to report on people who were not following the traditional agenda of the government. Of course, it was a very, uh, dangerous game and it's much more involved in physical abuse and eventually I had to flee. And uh, I landed in the United States and uh, absolutely being, uh, I guess, cut off the any ties with them, uh, Russia and uh, with the previous friends or former friends. And well, being in New York, being in the United States, of course, the first steps for each immigrant is how to reestablish and start over. And it was very difficult process because being with the career, uh, some career in Russia, nobody wants you here in the United States. Despite all of the uh, picturesque that the United States translates to the world that we are a country of immigrants. Yes, it's a country of immigrants, but uh, that's a capitalistic society which does not uh, welcome especially political uh, asylees as they welcome refugees, for example, right? Uh, and that's the first step we need to find, find the network. And that's how I got involved with Rus LGBT and eventually became a co-president. And Rus LGBT has been involved in multiple, multiple, multiple uh, advocacy work, uh, including working with Masha Gessen very closely. She's part of our, they are part of our community now. And in 2017, uh, Rus LGBT held the first protest when we heard the news uh, from the Nova Gazette, Elena Milashina, and from our friends in Russia about the uh, crackdown on uh, LGBTQ people in Chechnya, which I uh, call the genocide, and a lot of people still do not recognize it as genocide, because uh, even the international community does not use that language trying to avoid the contradiction. But it's definitely a genocide which falls on the all charters and all conventions in the 1950s, which was, uh, were implemented after the Holocaust. So uh, we had the news, we knew people there, and we directly involved with the Russian LGBT network, the organization which uh, courageously uh, rescued uh, uh, people from Chechnya. And we held the first protest, and after that we uh, had to communicate with a lot of uh, government bodies, but it was the Trump era and Trump administration. Rus LGBT had been uh, in negotiation with the State Department to open up the gate for a couple of them, uh, Chechen refugees, uh, and giving them humanitarian parole visas. And some uh, State Department employees were in favor, but we know that uh, Muslim ban and anti Muslim stances in the United States after 9 11 are very strong. And you will think that the United States uh, will admit all of them. Uh, it's not true because there is a particular political um, underground which operates uh, uh, not in favor of uh, immigrants. I even though they're queer immigrants, they still marked as Muslim and that's a potential danger for the American society in the propaganda way, right? And uh, those negotiations did not uh, have any result, any positive result, but we started doing a lot of protests and eventually the group of uh, young queer activists, millennials, uh, Americans uh, get in, got involved and they created the platform called Voices for Chechnya and now it's a queer activist group Voices for. And that's how we, um, we knew David 
before for his work and he came to our protest and we uh, were talking about that and uh, he told me about the idea of the movie and we, we were uh, supporting that. But of course, the stories which we've heard and probably you already not only through the movie and a lot of depicted in the movie and that's very terrible because uh, for some of us who went through the actual violence uh, for myself speaking for uh, physical violence against me, I cannot even imagine that level of violence which is going on in Chechnya, which honor killing uh, is projected onto the uh, LGBTIQ peers. And we have to understand that Chechnya, uh, after the 1994, after the civil war with Russia, uh, has been always demonized by the Russian people. And that's the problem that a lot of Russian queer people who live outside of Caucasus republics, they still anti-Muslim, they still anti-Chechen. And there is a very dangerous pattern. And even those immigrants who are here, they are not eager to help the people from Chechnya because Chechen people were portrayed by the government in 1990s as a, a terrorist, as a bandit, as a thieves and thugs. So which was absolutely uh, not true and irrelevant. But we uh, have received and we've actually uh, connected to the people who escaped Chechnya in a couple of the countries like Netherlands, Germany, they established their own network of those who are from uh, North Caucasus. And um, in 2017, it was a series of events and the world community learned about that uh, crisis and crackdown. But we cannot stop there because in, 2000, in December 2018, a new crackdown happened and it's still ongoing. And uh, when the new crackdown happened, I got in touch with some people who survived and they uh, told the stories about how they uh, uh, used as a uh, labor, as a free labor, how they beaten up, how they tortured, electrocuted. So all of those reports you could find uh, in the Russian LGBT network uh, website and you can donate there. Uh, but when you hear those testimonies from people, you literally going back to the uh, 1930s and 1940s concentration camps and people still uh, even amongst us, we are not using, some people avoid to use the concentration camp uh, term because it's kind of, uh, for them, diminishing the role of the Holocaust. But literally, what, uh, where those people kept, that's exactly a concentration camp. Let's say secret facility, let's say uh, secret prison, but it's definitely uh, elements of those Holocaust politics. And uh, I'm... When I watched, we watched a year ago when it just came out and David gave us permission to show to our public, to our audience, it was uh, absolutely horrific. And some people like Olga Barr uh, is deeply involved with Bruce LGBT as well. And we all consider them as heroes. And even all of us who survived uh, violence throughout different ages, uh, like anti-Semitic violence, anti-queer violence, or anti-ethnic violence, this is the critical peak which uh, we have to keep in mind. And sometimes people ask why we should care. And especially Americans uh, and American queer people, uh, cisgender, white uh, queer people will also ask why we should concern about what's going on in Chechnya. Because if it's going on in Chechnya, it could happen here in the United States. It could happen uh, with the, all of this uprising far right and uh, far right activists and the uh, that interaction that people did not believe that January 6th could have happened, but it happened. So we have to be uh, aware of that and we have to use all potential tools to um, involve people into that and to protest that. And I personally, I will tell you that Russian government will not do anything and Putin does not care what you say, what the government, uh, what the uh, international community says. So Putin is deeply uh, in his seclude, uh, secluded position, and Ramzan Kadyrov, who is the president of Chechnya, he is the closest ally and loyalist of Putin. That's why they will cover uh, up each other till the end. And th when that end um, comes, we never know, right? It could be 10 years from now. But uh, what we could do, we could donate, we could uh, try to talk to your representatives, to elected officials in the United States, to press the international community, to press even the State Department, the Homeland Security Department, to admit uh, refugees and LGBTIQ people uh, from Chechnya, because it's a shame that the country of immigrants does not accept those who most needed that in that critical point. So, and here I will pause. Thank you so much, Leosha. Uh, now we're going to go on to John Pachenkas. Uh, 
Great. Well, thank you. Good evening. It's an honor to be here to speak in the context of such a powerful film, and um, and especially after the tireless, brave work of um, of Leo Shep and and his advocacy and experience. Um, my name's John Pachenkis, and I'm a clinical psychologist and professor of public health here at Yale, and I direct um, the Yale LGBTQ Mental Health Initiative, which is a vibrant group of highly committed researchers um, interested in in understanding and improving LGBTQ people's mental health. It, I, I watched the film right when it came out. I was um, I was really eager to see it um, after um, reading Masha Gessen's work and, um, and, and having done some work in Eastern Europe and China um, and not knowing much about Chechnya. And right after the film, I turned to my husband and said, this film is going to change things and, and, it, and it has to change things. Um, and um, it, it, it's, it's a remarkably brave portrait of horrific abuse, but also of deep humanity, caretaking, and love. Um, but, but what can this film change? It, it joins the tireless work of advocates in Chechnya, across Russia, and around the world, working to ultimately change country conditions so that the narrative of LGBTQ life for any LGBTQ person moves beyond if they don't, don't kill you for a winner. At the Yale School of Public Health, um, we're studying the country conditions surrounding LGBTQ people and, and documenting the impact um, of those conditions on LGBTQ lives around the world. So by country conditions, we mean the laws, policies, and cultural attitudes um, that, 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 either lend, that either mean that LGBTQ people go about their lives beyond to expect support um, or go about their lives expecting family rejection, victimization, violence, religious-based rejection, conversion therapy, sexual violence, et cetera. Because all of those things lead to it, it can lead to deep internalized senses of shame, of self-hatred, um, and, um, and, and self-doubt, which ultimately lead to depression, chronic anxiety, and, 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 and suicide. So our research uses um, the largest data sets of LGBTQ people in the world, and, and, and they show strong associations between the, the cultural conditions um, surrounding LGBTQ people and their odds of depression, suicide, and anxiety. And what we see is that 30% of LGBTQ people in Russia, and these are people who participated in these surveys, um, not to mention those who, who would not identify themselves to researchers, 30% of those reported its strong suicidality in the past year. Whereas if you look in countries like the Netherlands or Denmark, you see half that, that percentage, half those odds. And we also see that that happens because in countries with, with homophobic transphobic policies, that, that leads LGBTQ people to go about their lives concealed, without social support, and with deep internalized senses that, that they've done something wrong, that they are wrong, that they're bad. Um, and, and, and what these analyses show is that the phenomenon is a matter of degree. With Russia and Chechnya being at, 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 a, at, a, at an extreme end of the continuum, but, but also most countries in the world have unfavorable conditions towards LGBTQ people. And, and in many of those countries, the conditions are getting worse. And even in those with favorable conditions, places like the US and Scandinavian countries, they weren't that favorable um, even, even 20 years ago. So what you have is a majority of the world's LGBTQ population being exposed to some, some degree of trauma um, from you know, from the horrific electrocution, being eaten alive by rats, being killed by one's family, showed in the film, to the daily threat of being ostracized and left out of the sources of esteem that accrue to heterosexual cisgender people, even in the most accepting societies in the world. And this is why in every country in which this has been studied, including the most accepting societies in the world, LGBTQ people are at least twice as likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, and to end their lives. Um, this is why our global modeling analyses estimate that 83% of the world's LGBTQ population is closeted for most or all people in their lives. This is why even among those who are out, the mental health costs of the closet, things like chronic anxious expectations of rejection, internalized self-hatred, self-doubt, tenuous feelings of belonging persist. And although, it, but, but this risk isn't equally distributed. So although our research shows that the more structurally homophobic the country, the greater the risk of depression and suicide. This risk decreases for those who leave their country and move to, to, to more supportive climates. So in a data set of about 100,000 gay and bisexual men, about 11,000 of whom had, had migrated, we found that the, their risk of depression and suicidality decreased for those migrants who had moved into a more supportive place. But it took about five years. And this is because the concealment um, the, the, um, the, the, the feelings of shame, et cetera, can persist 
um, and they take time um, to, um, to, um, to, to be undone and for people to, to, to grow past those lessons. We also find that as a country's laws and policies improve, the mental health of LGBTQ populations in those countries improves. This tells us that the damage can be undone, both from improving laws and policies, but also um, by supporting LGBTQ people and finding support, both through relocating, but also through finding personal esteem and support wherever they might be living. So to highlight some ways that our, our LGBTQ mental health initiative supports this mission. Um, first, we document the associations between country conditions around the world and the persistent traumatic impact that those unsupportive conditions can have. Um, we submit affidavits for LGBTQ immigration organizations to edu educate immigration judges and lawyers about the challenges of Im immigration among LGBTQ people, including the challenges of identity disclosure to, um, to strangers and authority figures, which is often a precursor to being granted asylum. Um, and we, document, we, we develop and, and implement mental health interventions delivered broadly and efficiently to LGBTQ people in high need settings in the US and around the world. These treatments are delivered by and for the LGBT community. They're based in rigorous theory and, and they're effective in improving the co-occurring mental health conditions that LGBTQ people face. So to me, the film showed not just the trauma and loss of life caused by country conditions and the need for good data and treatments, but also the remarkable courage, creativity, and resilience shown by the LGBT community across history and across places. It, it's truly remarkable and, and to see to see that that um, that resilience even against the backdrop of of such horrific trauma. Despite the odds, despite the trauma, most LGBTQ people flourish in, 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 in their own amazing ways. They build community, they take care of each other. In this way, the, 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 the closet can forge a remarkable resiliency, a worldview of the outsider and the deep empathy and courage that that can generate. What the film showed me um, is that LGBTQ people living under, under threats to life and physical safety continue to show the world the value of integrity, of authenticity, of community building, and of love. Um, so, um, it, 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 so that's what the film can change. It, it shines a light on the, on the beauty of LGBTQ people's lives and courage, even in the harshest conditions. And it impels the world to turn its attention to this compelling case to support those LGBTQ people fighting for their lives and also just fighting for the right to love. Um, that support allows brave people like Maxine to speak their truth to the international community of advocates um, as an urgent call for resources from legal to clinical to material to emotional to ultimately change country conditions, but also to, to um, respect LGBTQ people's right to, to authenticity and love. Um, so thank you to the LGBT Chechens in the film, um, to the persecuted everywhere, to Leosha and his life story and work, to Deidre and all the community advocates and those who brought us this film, um, including Neil. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for giving us the background of what you're doing at Yale and how it's affecting LGBTQ people around the world. Um, the more we hear about it, the more we see it, the more we can speak out about it. We're going to move on to uh, Deirdre Stradone, uh, and um, please go ahead, Deirdre. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, and like Losha and John said, I'm also just very honored uh, to have been invited to speak here tonight and to join this distinguished panel. So I am uh, currently the co-deputy director at Sanctuary for Families Immigration Intervention Project, um, which is a nonprofit organization located in New York City. And we provide services to survivors of domestic violence and gender-based violence. And we represent clients on a wide variety of humanitarian immigration applications, including offensive, um, affirmative and defensive asylum. Uh, prior to Sanctuary, I was a staff attorney with African Services Committee, a nonprofit located in Harlem. And there I represented individuals living with HIV on a wide variety of civil legal matters, including um, immigration. And despite the name, we actually worked with immigrants from all over the world. And that's when I first started working with um, Russian speaking LGBT asylum seekers um, through an introduction with Losha. Um, so thank you Losha really for um, introducing me to this world and, and this community of people. I'm, I'm just really grateful um, to be able to be here and to be an ally and to be able to use my um, education and my voice to listen and to support and help people who have had so many of their human rights taken away from them. 
Um, so this film was particularly powerful and moving to me um, because it showcased stories in a way that I thought I was familiar with. Um, so as an immigration attorney who's worked on dozens of asylum cases, I've heard similar stories of threats and assaults and rapes and torture from my clients. But by the time my clients come to me, they are three or six or more months away from the situation that made them flee. So to watch people that were still um, in the middle of their suffering and in the middle of the danger was just really heartbreaking for me. And, and it really brought me to understand more of like what my clients have faced before they come and see me. Um, so what I was thinking and, and how I can be most useful to the panel tonight is to talk to you a little bit about asylum law and to talk to you about where the movie ends, what happens next? How does somebody obtain and apply for asylum here in the United States? So in the US, we derive our asylum law from international law and it's codified in the Immigration and Nationality Act or the INA. Um, to paraphrase it, um, somebody is eligible for asylum if they've suffered harms rising to the level of persecution or they have a well-founded fear of future harms rising to the level of persecution on account of a protected ground meaning their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, their government is unwilling or unable to protect them, and then it's not reasonable or safe for them to relocate within um, their home country. So I'm gonna take some time to go through those eligibility requirements and try to provide some samples from LGBT Russian asylum cases that I've worked on to give a little bit more context. So first, what is a harm rising to the level of persecution? So this is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's considered cumulatively, so over the course of somebody's life. It can include both physical and mental suffering, non-life-threatening violence, and severe economic deprivation. So what do I do as an attorney to help establish that my client has suffered persecution? Well, we go through their entire life story. So we start with, you know, in childhood, child abuse when a parent might assume their sexual orientation, bullying, being called derogatory names, and we work through their life to when they're an adult and there's instances of being threatened or assaulted, um, when they're lured to an apartment through online dating and then beaten up and extorted, or they're fired from work, um, or when they're intentionally de denied life-saving HIV medication, they're detained, they're tortured. That is persecution and that's what we need to learn from our clients. Second, what is the protected ground? So typically for LGBT cases, we use that catch-all phrase, the membership in a particular social group or PSG as we call it. And a PSG is defined as people who share a common immutable characteristic. So that's something about themselves they can't change or they shouldn't have to change. It has to be defined with particularity and it has to be socially distinct within that culture. So some examples of PSGs that I've used for my Russian cases um, would be Russian homosexual men or Russian lesbian women. I work with my client to figure out how do you define yourself? Why did the persecution happen to you? And that's how we craft the PSG together. Countless circuit courts have found that sexual orientation qualifies as membership in a particular social group and typically grants asylum on that basis. So next is the nexus. And to me, this is the most important part of an asylum claim because it's not enough to establish that my client has been the victim of persecution or that they're the member of a particular social group. It's understanding why did that harm happen to them? So we have to establish it happened to them because of their sexual orientation. So how do we do this? We need to understand the context in which the persecution occurred. So what happened immediately preceding this form of persecution? Where was, what, where was my client physically located when this happened to them? So for example, I have a client who was leaving a gay nightclub one night in Moscow. From my understanding, from working with my clients, the gay nightclubs are typically in more secluded areas. So if you're there, it's probably because you had been at that nightclub. So he's leaving with a friend, walking down the street, a man comes up to them and says, oh, hey, can I have a cigarette? Calls him some derogatory names for a gay person and then beats him up. Um, another example could be a client that is living with HIV. He goes to the clinic for his first appointment. The doctor's asking him, do you have sex with men or with women? And when my client refuses to answer, that answer is assumed for him. And the doctor tells him, I'm only going to give you outdated medication because there's a shortage of antiretroviral medication in the country. And we save the new medication for heterosexual couples. 
So do you see how with those two examples, we're establishing the nexus between the persecution, which is the assault or the intentional deprivation of medication with their sexual orientation, with their protected ground. And then I'll, I'll combine the last two parts. Um, so this is establishing that the government is unwilling or unable to protect somebody and that the applicant cannot safely and reasonably move to another part of the country. Um, and both of these heavily depend on country condition research like John was talking about. So for the Russian cases, this is unsurprisingly very easy to prove. Um, you can watch the film, Welcome to Chechnya. You can go to their website and you can see how they have links to help you understand LGBT persecution in a global context. You can also look to the US Department of State Human Rights Report, which is a necessity to include and cite to in any asylum case. And that confirms the persecution of the LGBT community in Russia. It has statements such as, quote, openly gay men were particular targets of societal violence, or, quote, medical practitioners reportedly continue to deny or limit LGBT persons' health services due to intolerance and prejudice. So now that you understand asylum law, after a five minute overview, um, how does one apply for asylum? So an asylum seeker applies for asylum on form I-589. So the form is mainly biographical, but it does include some questions requiring short answers about your past persecution, your fears of future persecution, um, your fears of torture, other questions related to your admissibility to the United States, such as any arrests or criminal history, and other questions related to your baseline eligibility for asylum, like are you applying within the one year filing deadline? Um, for affirmative applications, so that's typically the clients that I work with from Russia, they've entered on a tourist visa and they are affirmatively uh, alerting immigration to the fact that they're in the United States. They apply to the, to the US Citizenship and Immigration Services and their cases are heard at the asylum office. For people that you know, typically will like, cross the border, enter without inspection, um, for some reason are placed into removal proceedings or immigration court, that's a defensive application and the 589 would be filed with the court. Um, to focus a little bit on affirmative cases, because that's typically what I'm doing with the Russian cases that I work on, they'll be scheduled for an interview at an asylum office, um, kind of based on the jurisdiction of their residence. So I do New York and New Jersey. Um, from about January 2018 until March of last year, um, asylum seekers would typically be scheduled for an interview within one to two months of filing their asylum application. Because of COVID, um, the asylum offices were closed and now they're operating on a limited uh, capacity. So it's very difficult to gauge when people will be um, scheduled for their interviews. To give like my personal examples, I've been filing about one asylum application a month, a month since last April, and nobody's been scheduled for an interview. My last asylum case that was scheduled for an interview had been filed in December of 2019 and heard um, on January 27th, 2020. He received his approval notice in June of 2020, and he's eligible to apply for his green card this year. Um, the green card will probably take about two years or more to be adjudicated. And so that is actually a very fast moving case for asylum. So this is a very slow process. I have clients who filed for asylum in 2016 and they're still waiting for their interviews. Um, at the interview, the asylum seeker will submit their evidence packet. And so as part of the packet, I include briefing to show their narrative and their eligibility for asylum based on the law. We include their um, affidavit, witness statements, photographs, medical records, psychological evaluations, and country conditions. At the interview, it will last for about two or three hours, and it's typically non-adversarial and really meant to be fact gathering. The asylum seeker is supposed to receive their decision two weeks later, but that doesn't always happen. They can either get the grant and then move on to the green card application in one year, or their case can't be denied, but it will be referred to immigration court and they have to do it again. Um, so that's an overview of my work and I'm just really grateful for this film. I think it's really inspired me to continue to do this work for this vulnerable community and to continue to work with groups like RUSA, like Losha mentioned, to ensure that asylum seekers in New York um, have access to representation and that people who don't have representation at least have the tools to be able to represent, represent themselves successfully pro se. Um, so thank you so much for letting me be here. <laughs> thank you so much, Deirdre. That was a terrific presentation and overview. Um, I, I learned a lot and I was involved in the film. So uh, it's such a complicated, torturous route uh, that the refugees must follow. And I'm glad that I do to support them.
We'll move on to uh, Sten Berman, who's the Dean of the Public Health at Yale, who will um, wrap up for us this part and then we'll go into a conversation with all of us. Thanks, Neil. It's uh, impossible for me to uh, do better than Leosha and, uh, and uh, John, um, uh, you know, Deidre, uh, yourself. Um, really, you're all heroes to me because the kind of work that's being done is a, is a strike for humanity and uh, for um, everything that we represent in the field of public health. Public health is very prevention oriented is very um, human rights oriented, um, uh, health equity and access to um, health uh, care, access to good uh, education, job opportunities, the, uh, the, the, the avoidance of, um, shall we say, housing and food insecurity. All of this is, is prevention. All of this is towards health. And because the United States doesn't do as well at uh, social services as some of our Western European counterparts do, um, we have an imbalance of uh, investment. We spend much more on health care and much less on social services, and we get worse outcomes. In Western Europe, uh, the balance is skewed towards social services. So they're not discharging someone from the hospital into a homeless uh, condition the way we would we do every day in the United States. Now, um, you go to Chechnya, uh, you have a middle income region of, um, of Russia. Uh, there is a reasonable uh, opportunity to have a, a safe and happy life there. But if you are a gay or a lesbian or trans, you uh, can be uh, exposed to, as Leosha put it, uh, um, uh, genocidal types of conditions. And John was very articulate in um, reminding us how common this is. Uh, many of us remember Matthew Shepard, uh, a young man uh, uh, who was making friends at a bar. He was essentially lured out of the bar and then killed and hung on a fence in uh, the Wyoming winter. Uh, in the United States, and this happens all the time. Matthew Shepard was um, highlighted for us. A movie was made about it, uh, his story, but this is a recurring theme, the uh, brutalization of uh, people in the LGBT community, and John and Leosha have been very articulate. Um, the work that uh, Deidre is doing is just extraordinary. Um, the um, the, the, early in my career, I met a few heroic um, lawyers uh, doing human rights work, doing work in the HIV field, and I stopped telling lawyer jokes, which doctors love to tell lawyer jokes. I just stopped because I said this is this is this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is a this is a field that can be used just like any field for good or not so good, and there are so many uh, lawyers who are. Spending their entire careers trying to alleviate uh, human suffering and uh, further human rights. And that pretty much sounded like uh, a, a member of my faculty in the School of Public Health. So, what's the difference? And the skill set that it takes to be an attorney negotiating these complex uh, legal um, hurdles is really quite extraordinary. So, I wanted to uh, just uh, tell you a little bit about a new initiative spearheaded by uh, Judy Lickman in a moment, and I'm happy to see uh, um, uh, Darth Ross and uh, Tiger uh, Christie and others on the on the, the who joined this evening. And this is uh, something we call Happy, the Humanities Art and Arts in Public Health Practice at Yale. Happy is an explicit uh, initiative of our school to try to take advantage of great literature that has meaningful public health and uh, prevention messages. Uh, one can think of uh, Henrik Ibsen writing uh, a play about syphilis uh, and the stigma and suppression of, um, of open um, discussion and open um, uh, battling of syphilis because there was so much stigma in 19th century Norway. 
uh, that, that play is called Ghosts. And then you have an enemy of the people, uh, which was an interesting uh, phrase that Donald Trump expropriated to talk about the press. But the, an enemy of the people in uh, drama is Ibsen's play about a heroic Dr. Stockman who blows the whistle on an epidemic in his town and is vilified for it. Um, you can fast forward to uh, great literature in the 20th century and even um, The Plague by Albert Camus has tremendous uh, lessons about uh, uh, pandemic response. Um, then we have, of course, um, television. We have film, both dramatization uh, like uh, Philadelphia uh, or with Tom Hanks or um, this uh, film, Welcome to Chechnya in the, in the, in the uh, um, uh, realm of documentary. And this documentary had the um, technical innovations that Neil described at the beginning, which were absolutely extraordinary and really redefines how we can do uh, real life stories for vulnerable individuals. And I think that is, uh, uh, if we had nothing but this amazing technological innovation, we would have a lot. But beyond that, we have the story of Welcome to Chechnya. Um, we are eager to expand uh, the use of the arts, uh, drama, uh, film. Um, we are eager to consider music for its wellness features, its educational features. And we think too little is being done in this space in the public health field. And um, Yale happens to be strong in the humanities and the arts, very strong. And we have so many partners, uh, the Schwarzman Center among them, uh, to further this agenda. I'm dropping something in, uh, I'm dropping, ooh, I'm, I'm being told that my audio is wonky, so I'm gonna just hold it up like this. Thanks, Sappho. So I'm going to also drop something in the um, Zoom. Uh, thanks to Linda Berganzi King, one of our alumni who um, is, uh, alumna who is on the, on, in, in, this, in this evening event. Uh, three years ago, we had a film series in public health, and uh, one movie that really uh, affected me a lot, it, it was the juxtaposition of LGBT issues and climate change issues. And if that juxtaposition intrigues you, feel free to look at the movie Denial about Christine Hallquist, who most recently ran for governor of Vermont. She lost but her story of coming out as a trans woman uh, from having been um, the CEO of a, um, an electricity cooperative in Northern Vermont is quite an extraordinary story told by the filmmaker son. And I mentioned it to you be, to, to sort of give you a sense that we would like this to be a continuing process, uh, bringing the major issues of the day whether it is uh, LGBTQ issues in which we hope our school will, under John Pachenkis' leadership, be a leading light in this field, I think it already is, um, and be a place where we can train the next generation of educators and, uh, and researchers uh, in LGBT mental health. Also, uh, the issues around uh, other major issues, uh, pandemic preparedness and response is a good choice. I wonder why that came to mind, and uh, climate change, another one. So many compelling issues in which film, television, um, drama, um, the arts, uh, music, literature uh, can uh, open people's eyes in a way that a public health le lecture perhaps won't. Uh, we can uh, pass on uh, facts, we can pass on evidence base, we can uh, highlight um, the uh, plight of vulnerable persons around the world in various conditions, but to dramatize it, to have it sink into one's heart and soul, that may be um, where the humanities and the arts can help us uniquely. Um, I wanted to uh, really um, highlight the Happy Initiative and then turn it over to Neil and to Judy Lichtman for our audience participation. And thank you very much, a special thanks to Neil 
for having uh, helped us organize this from the start and making it possible for us to learn about this film. Thank you, Sten, very much for your support. The School of Public Health, the happy initiative that Judy Lichtman and uh, Tiger Christie have spearheaded uh, is so important. Here's Judy and um, we're uh, hopeful that we can begin at Yale to do a number of different projects that really focus on bringing the humanities and arts to these questions as this movie does. Um, so we're going to have a conversation and if you have questions, uh, Judy will give them to us, but I'll start. So um, I wanna talk about the United States. So as you all know, uh, two, state legislator, two state legislatures, uh, Tennessee and Arkansas have passed laws that say that people uh, can use uh, their sincerely held religious beliefs to um, withhold uh, medical treatment for trans people. Um, it's going to the Republican governors of both of those states to see if it will be signed or not, but we're seeing this happen now in two states and likely in others. Um, John, Leosha, Stan, Deirdre, uh, Judy, what, what are your thoughts about uh, what's going on in the US? Uh, what can we do about it? Um, certainly telling these stories are important. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on how in a sense, of course, this is not genocide, but it is um, very worrisome. And as Leosha said, these are steps that can lead to worse and worse things happening. So um, Leosha, you, you mentioned that um, what we need to do in the US in terms of supporting Chechen and Jamaican and Ugandan and Nigerian and other Syrian and other um, uh, LGBTQ refugees is to allow them into the country. What more can we do both here in the US, in your opinion, and also uh, to, to change attitudes. You, you work on this. And also, please, John, Deirdre, Judy, and Sten, please uh, add to the conversation. But we'll start with Leosha. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. The first, what the Americans should do is to revise their own history and to see and to acknowledge that that institutional persecution of queer people, of Black people, of Indigenous people, it's not the myth. It's a reality because when people deny their own history, they cannot admit others. And that's why they always say that it's not important to us, but it's very important. And your example, so example, other states where uh, anti-trans bills to prohibit uh, trans kids to participate in school sport, it's a very uh, dangerous initiative. And people say, oh, it's somewhere there. Like New Yorkers like to say, New York is there. Uh, kind of the salad bowl of the world. It's a diverse place, and we don't care what in the other America happens. That's a division within even the United States that we don't listen to each other, right? And what we can do uh, to tell our stories, and that helps because even with Russian speaking LGBTQ immigration, when influx in 2013 reached the ceiling, people were asking, why Russian queers come to the United States? You're, it seems like your uh, country is not so bad. Even the media discourse, uh, very particular and very selective. So we need to do grassroots. We need to educate people. We need to educate neighbors. We need to uh, start to uh, show or do the showcases like probably a Happy Initiative and on uh, on my campus we do. And I live in a very Republican, uh, white, cisgender county of Butler in Pennsylvania, one of the most conservative. So we need to just challenge our own biases and limitations and uh, about the trans health, for example, to bring people to talk about why, why it's very important. So that's what we can do as educators, as a public, even as ordinary citizens or not non-citizens, right? So just to acknowledge that it's not, they do not push aside. And I keep saying, and Americans do not like that I say that, but Russians and Americans so uh, close enough to each other in propaganda machine. The brainwashing in Russia, it's more open than brainwashing in here, but brainwashing was happening in certain parts of the United States. It's even more, it's even worse than in Russia because people still pretend to be uh, very accepting, pretend to be inclusive, uh, but the, those cases of those states could be very uh, destructive. And we already see that the 
uh, Biden administration is struggling with those uh, Congress people and senators trying to make a deal with them, which should not be allowed because uh, we will sign the uh, Equality Act if you give us more religious freedom. What more religious freedom you can give in the country based on religious freedom? So that's the things we should acknowledge and start with ourselves and our neighbors and our peers and relatives and uh, students probably. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, John, let me ask you about what the research shows. So, so Sten and I have been doing some work on vaccine hesitancy and we're, we've been looking at the different kinds of groups who are hesitant. Everybody is not hesitant for the same reason. Some are wanting to be independent and have freedom. Others are conspiracists. Others are apocryphal people. Others are uh, African-Americans who have um, not been, you know, given access to, to healthcare in the same way as, as, uh, as uh, privileged white people. So what does the research show in terms of how we can do what Leosha just said? What kinds of stories work? Uh, what can we each do as individuals and as storytellers? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the one unique, somewhat unique quality of the LGBTQ population is that it is a minority, numeric minority population, but it is randomly and diffusely distributed across the world. So LGBTQ people exist in all families, right? Even when you look at the numbers, you, you, everyone's related to, to an LGBTQ person. They exist across all religious groups, across all um, all um, um, communities across all cities and all states. The burden can't fall on LGBTQ people to tell their story and to come out. Like, the, it, but but it's um, but it's um, it's an iterative process. The more uh, people come out, the more people tell um, stories of "I am your son" or "I am your your congregant, your co-congregant," or "I am your classmate" or "your coworker." Um, the more you have, you create safe conditions where where that can spread quickly. Um, at the same time, we know that laws and policies also shape, they, they don't just reflect population attitudes, but they push populations, you know, in a, in a, in a gradual way towards, um, towards progress in this case. So, you know, the, the, they're are amazing, remarkable people who come out. The, 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 the turning point, in the, 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 the most moving part of the film for me was when Maxine came out. I, I think that was probably intentional. I'm not a filmmaker, but I could, I, the, but, but, but I, I, was, I was deeply moved at that moment. Um, not everyone can do that. Not everyone's personality is that. Not everyone's conditions are that. Um, um, and, and, um, and, and not everyone can be that type of hero. And so, 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 so the work of people, of people who create the conditions where that's possible um, is just as important as, as, um, as individual stories um, because that work ultimately leads to more stories being told in, in people's local lives and families and communities. Well, you know, what's, what's so compelling, I think, about Welcome to Chechnya is that, as you just said, John, uh, if we look at, at TV shows in the United States like Will and Grace or Modern Family, they normalized queerness in a way that hadn't been seen on TV before, that everybody, as you were just saying, has some relative, has someone. And so we can keep working on that, like our connectivity with each other, with our families. What's so profound about Chechnya is that that's been turned on its head. So instead of being a protector, being, a, being an embracer of our family members, of our friends, um, Masha Gessen made this, it's wrote in, an, in her 2017 piece that um, Chechnya is a mafia state that uses religious rhetoric to enforce control over its citizens. And I think that's what's so difficult as Leosha was saying, as Deirdre was talking about too, that, that there has been a story told in Chechnya that has um, uh, in, encouraged family members to not see this as some, not to see their family members uh, and embrace them as, as we have tried to do with our stories on television and in movies and in literature in the United States. And this is what's really compelling and difficult because Leosha just said also that the barriers are Putin and Kadarov. So what can we do? This is, this is a question more for Deirdre and, and Leosha. What can we do, Leosha, you said, you know, Putin's, you know, not going to, to move. I know that Macron has said, has, has, has made statements. Um, is it the UN? Is it, what, 
what can we do besides trying to sneak people out, which is so dangerous? Um, what are your thoughts, Deirdre and Leosha, about this problem where the story is so complex in Chechnya uh, and, and, and difficult because of what they're saying to the public about their own family members and friends? Moshe, I'll let, I'll let you start um, with answering that. I mean, I'm happy to speak about like what we can do to help people if they're able to escape, but I think Losha might be able to speak better about what we can actually be doing to help. Before they escape, yes, exactly. This is the, the real, and, and, and I think what you'll, what it also applies to the United States and this whole issue of demonizing trans people too now, so. That's a very rhetorical question because um, I know there is an optimism within the LGBTQ activist circles of Russia and they are more positive because they have to stay that way in order to survive and not burn themselves out because I remember that. And But I don't have a confidence that the Russian society, even Putin dies tomorrow, will change over the night because it's a mentality which has broken, right? Has been broken. And, uh, in and it's two different Russias, as I already pointed out, the Chechnya. And the problem is that um, family members under pressure and they probably, some of them flee with their relatives, but it's very rare because otherwise uh, they will be persecuted as well. So it's a tough choice. And some related to me that uh, mothers and fathers will not do brothers, uncles did it, uncles killed, right? So there is a horrific thing. So uh, we cannot do because it's an, um, it's an independent state. We cannot do the Cold War. We cannot do another Iraq. We cannot do another Afghanistan. And nobody, and they might never ever go to Russia. They never dear uh, American school have the rhetoric. And I uh, admire the Biden's administration dedication to LGBTQ cause, but uh, politically we cannot do anything because when we do sanctions, we harm not Putin. We harm the ordinary people of Russia who are struggling and suffering from the shortage of. So that's why uh, the easiest way for us, uh, for, for our diaspora, for Russian LGBTQ community in Russia, we're trying to adjust those who are already there and help those organizations, those who are still struggling in the front line of Russia. That's the only way we can do. And also being here, we have to tell our stories and that's sometimes humiliating that we again and again and again have to explain to the American public, we are not uh, coming to you, we are not trying to invade you, we are not trying to take over, we are trying to follow the institutional opportunity. For some of us, it's very crucial. That's the only way we can do. And unfortunately, uh, I don't see any international mechanism which could uh, enable because so many LGBTQ cases in the European Court of Rights, but Russia does not recognize anymore, even it's in the constitution. So Putin is a, is a fan fanatic who uh, doesn't, who just like uh, barricades himself and he can do whatever he wants because he's still bluffing and uh, threatening the West with the nuclear weapons. So let's focus uh, what we can do in small steps, even small donations, even small, uh, spread of the information about uh, those who are here already uh, and how we can connect to those organizations who are in the barricade in Russia, for example. That's the only thing, unfortunately, what we can do for now. We, oh. do, we do have steps um, that people can take if they go to welcometochechnia.com and take action um, to support Maxim's international court case, LGBTQ organizations in Russia. Um, some someone else was going to just speak. Um, yeah, no, I um, Neil, I was going to um, mention that there have been a couple questions, uh, and I think to bring together a few themes about whether this is uh, sort of initiated by the region. Is this unique to this area, and is it cultural within, or is it adopting cultural issues from outside? And I think this also gets to what you were talking about. Um, our examples, things like modern family will embrace, uh, but I, I think it gets at some of the shifting norms. But I, I'm, I think the questions are, is this really so regionally localized and what are the influences? Are they from internal or external? Okay, I'll, I'll so it's definitely, so Chechnya itself uh, was not like that before Kadyrov took power, right? So Chechnya was on the way to democratize itself with the, his father in charge. Of course, they've always been a traditional 
and uh, Muslim region, but during the Soviets, of course, it was a little bit different, but uh, they were a separate culture. They were, uh, it was a separate culture before Russian Empire took them over in 19th century and uh, colonized them and totally destroyed. And that's the kind of uh, heritage and trauma uh, of the generations. But uh, overall, Chechen people are very welcoming, so kind-hearted. They're amazing people. And it's only 5% of those who control the power, like Kadyrov. And Chechnya is a tribal culture, right? So it's a different tribes who control, like a, um, a Kadhafi's country, right? So in Kadyrov, with the threats, with the fear of um, annihilation and uh, any, uh, or elimination, uh, controls the power through the troops through the law enforcement through the uh, threats so for russia in general it's not the similar culture so the culture of russia is very divided from my home region it's very multi-ethnic multicultural region but homophobia and transphobia and biphobia and other phobias come from the uh we have a, we it's a lack of knowledge because during the soviet reign the uh possibility of learning about stonewall and something like that totally was uh, eliminated. That's why there it's everyday life homophobia, which not necessarily institutional and on the institutional level, like propaganda law, pedophilia law, or our laws, they kind of align with the everyday life homophobia and makes it stronger because on the daily basis, nobody cares about your sexuality. Most of the Russian people, they do not care. And we grew in that uh, environment. They will crack jokes, but not beat you, but but only when Putin introduced the church and introduced that concept of traditional values, Russians all of a sudden became aware of existence of LGBTIQ, started parading because LGBTIQ equals West. West is the number one enemy. It's a Cold War rhetoric. That's why culturally a lot of people in Russia are not homophobic, but they're afraid what could happen if they would stand up. Uh, for LGBTIQ people. That's why, but Chechnya is outstanding, of course. Even neighbors like uh, Dagestan uh, and other in Gushetia, more tolerant, they do not have those institutional uh, genocide uh, against LGBTIQ people. It doesn't mean that it's easy to live there, but it's easier compared to Chechnya. And, and we. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask Jana a question. Was um, a little bit about some of the challenges and barriers of obtaining data. You reported on some of the prevalences and some of the issues, and I, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about what are some of the challenges and what are some of the key elements that you think are really important for us to obtain to be able to think about, as you were saying, services and opportunities that are very much needed for this population and and for our society. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a hard it's a tough. Question. I teach a whole class on this, which which Leo should gave a guest lecture to last week. Um, but it, it, the the biggest challenge is that there's no there's no sampling. There's no it is near impossible to define the population of LGBTQ people because people's identities are fluid across the lifespan. You know, with within a person, um, people are are um, are known to themselves as LGBTQ, known to others, etc. But so so it's it's near impossible to get an accurate representation of the the state of LGBTQ. People. But that's even that's that's certainly true. A, a, a near perfect function of 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 these cultural conditions of homophobia and transphobia. Um, even in, in Canada, 30% of gay and bisexual men tell researchers, I, I would never disclose my sexual orientation on a government survey. That's Canada. So, so, so what we have is that the, the countries that we are able to collect data from are, are, are places like Russia. And in, in those data sets, we know that the, the majority of, let's say, gay and bisexual men are identifying as bisexual and, and, and heterosexual of, of men who are having sex with men. So it, whereas in Western Europe, you know, like the vast majority are identifying as gay. So the Pop, what that tells us is that the population looks very different depending on where um, you know on, on on where you're um, on, on what what countries or which or which locations you're sampling from. But I mean, the I think within your question is like like data is is incredibly important. Um, data presented um, for you know for for LGBT rights cases in the U.S. all the time, including you know the case for same-sex marriage. A lot of that rested on social science 
data coll collected in the U.S. But 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 at a more local level, um, asylum cases are are you know are come from being able to tell immigration judges that no people are not going to come out. People a traumatized population is not going to come out by default when they arrive to this country saying I'm here because I'm LGBTQ. When judges are like, well, why didn't you tell anyone? Why aren't you living LGBTQ? What you know? And it's like, well, th th that that looks different. It, LGBTQ life looks different where I'm from. I'm not going to come to this to this place to strangers tell um, um, tell authority figures that I'm LGBTQ because that is associated with me being tortured um, where I'm coming from. And but being able to, to document that that's not population epidemiologic data. That, that we have students at YSPH doing doing qualitative research with asylum seekers with um, with people in an in incarceration setting, documenting the challenges of even just being out being a data point, if you will. Um, um, it, um, and, 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 and going back to one of Neil's questions, that storytelling in some cases is as compelling, if not more compelling than being able to ascertain a large population of people where, where that population is hard to define um, and, and kind of always, always in flux. When the Equality Act uh, was being just debated in the Senate last week, we saw a trans uh, teenager give an impassioned uh, speech that really carried uh, across the United States uh, and opened people's eyes, I think, in, in many ways. And there's a piece in Scientific American, I believe, recently by a psychiatrist named Jack Turbin, who actually, as you're saying, John, looked at the data on trans uh, uh, women in sports. And the stories that were being told by many senators do not jibe with the real data uh, the facts. And so one thing we say in the HAPPY initiative is that we ground our stories in science. And so when we heard the young uh, trans woman uh, from, I believe it was Washington State or Oregon speaking, um, she was telling her story and she was telling the story of other students. And that emotional um, uh, storytelling helps us to contextualize what people are going through. But we, as you were saying, really need the data. And so, you know, I recommend Jack's piece because it shows that what was being said and discussed and thrown around in the Senate was actually not true, that there were no threats to girls sports. And in Connecticut, that the, the person, the, 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 the young woman that they were, were um, uh, showing who claimed that she was at a disadvantage had actually beaten somebody <laughs> who is trans. So we have to keep the data going and we have to use that data to inform our stories because we can move people emotionally, as Stan said, but people are moving each other emotionally with that, with stories that are not true. And so that's where, where we come in as, as, as scientists, as physicians, as researchers to um, uh, bring and marshal the data and use it to tell compelling, emotionally driven stories um, as well. So I'm gonna to go to, to Deirdre and Stan before we wrap up just to, um, to have some final thoughts on, on tonight's discussion. Deirdre, please. Oh, just, I'll just go. Um, I think, so something I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about this a lot and, and watching the movie and, and speaking with everyone here tonight is, is ways to make asylum so I, I think my my area of expertise is definitely not in advocacy and legislation. That's just not something that I'm that familiar with. I don't know how to change the laws. But what I feel like I can do is make asylum law more understandable and more attainable to people. So there are so many asylum seekers coming to the United States, many LGBT asylum seekers. I wish I had data um, to provide, but there's so many. And, and hopefully maybe listening to me talk tonight about LGBT asylum is it is winnable. It's a grantable case without me. I mean, I love that I'm there and I love that I can support people, but you don't need me. Um, there's a, a big secret that you don't actually need an attorney, especially if you're a Russian speaking. So I mean, like post-Soviet bloc countries, LGBT asylum seeker, your case is strong. Your country conditions are strong. As long as you can tell a consistent, incredible narrative, you can get asylum granted, um, especially because our cases, like I mentioned, are typically in front of an asylum officer. So it's not an adversarial proceeding. You're not in front of a judge. You're not going up against a, a prosecutor trying to deport you. You're just telling your story. And I think if people know how to do that, and, and that's why I'm working with RUSA of how to build sample narratives, how to create a witness statement. What does a country condition reports look like? 
what other kind of evidence do you need? I would love to be able to do that and then help more people. I, I continue to directly represent clients, but be able to have them help themselves. And I think that that's even more incredible for people who have been so silenced to be able to come and advocate for themselves and not have to speak through me. That that would be amazing to me. Um, some thoughts on that. <laughs> I just add that Deidre has been an angel for us because she's been taking cases uh, beyond her capacity. And that's a very important for many lawyers to realize that sometimes if you have time spot, please help. Uh, and that's the only thing that we ask for. Just provide guidance, not necessary to take that case, uh, but provide some guidance and advice. Well, as Deirdre is saying, the stories make a difference. And so we have to keep telling them. Um, Sten, uh, we'll wrap up with you and then we'll, we'll um, end uh, shortly. So, Neil, I'm not a particularly good storyteller. My wife tells stories much better than I do. I tend to give away the punchline well into the first uh, 30 seconds before we the effect. But I am a great admirer of storytellers and to hear your um, legacy of um, pushing 30 years uh, of, um, of health themes, educational themes within drama, within um, uh, the television uh, milieu. Um, and John, you were very articulate that science can, it, it, part of science is telling stories. Qualitative research has everything to do with case studies, and everything to do with uh, appreciating the dynamics of a, of a health circumstance, uh, a life circumstance through a story. And uh, I hope we will uh, keep this flame alive at the Yale School of Public Health because, um, you know, I'm a pretty good epidemiologist and it's, it's very much uh, the quantitative side, the, the, the large data side, the evidence side uh, sort of the clinical liaison side, and not so much uh, the story side. I've, uh, for, I've been privileged to work with uh, social psychologists, clinical psychologists, uh, medical anthropologists, uh, uh, sociologists, and others who are, who are better at telling those stories. So I've learned from them, but I'm not so good at it myself. And I do feel like this happy initiative is a very substantial step in the direction of bringing the pendulum of our school closer to the center. Uh, trust me, I got nothing against uh, epidemiology or big data or biostatistics. So that's what I do for a living. And I'll continue to defend me and Judy for what we do for a living. But the flip side of it is incredibly important. So think of, uh, I'll just leave everybody on the phone with one thought. Think about what you learned from seeing this film, Welcome to Chechnya, and think about what kind of tables or figures uh, you might have seen to give you the same impression. And I think that sort of sums it up. You, you know, now I think once you've appreciated the magnitude of the discrimination and violence that we're up against in even in 2021, now maybe you can take a look at a table or a figure and say, oh my God, look at the magnitude. But until you have something that touches you, something that uh, puts you yourself in, in the shoes of the protagonist, it's gonna be tough to really embrace the field fully. So congratulations to everybody on the panel. I was so impressed with the commentary. Uh, Neil, we wanna thank you for what you did to make this uh, movie possible. And Leosha, uh, it's extraordinary what you do. Um, uh, uh, you know, Deidre, uh, and of course, you know, John, I'm your biggest fan, a absolutely your biggest fan. So thanks very much for the evening. Thank you. Thank you yeah, all. And I was going to just say thank you, everybody, and more to come from Happy and storytelling to really have an impact on societal and community health.